ki mai, kake mai. Whakarongo ki te tangi a te hui, a hui, hui mai tātou, fiti, fiti, kōrero fiua ki te aoe. Hei mā taki taki, hei whakarongo rongo, mā te tini me te mano e. Tēnā koutou, ko te mētua tahi, he mihi tēnei ki ngā uri o Ngāti Whātua, i pōwhiri mai i a mātou i tō koutou whenua. Tēnā koutou. Me mihi kātika ki ngā rangatira, ko Rāmai Hayward, ko Barry Barclay, ko Don Selwyn. Nā rātou, i whakatāko tō te ara ki roto i te ao kiriata mō te iwi Māori. Kei te mihi, kei te mihi, kei te mihi. Ko wai tēnei e tū ake nei. Ko Ngāti Pikiao, ko Ngāti Whakahemo, ko Ngai Te Rangi Oku Iwi, ko au te pōtiki o Merata Mita rāua ko Jeff Murphy, ko Heperi Mita tō kuenua. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Hello. My name is Hepi. I'll translate a little bit for you what I just said. Initially, I acknowledged the land of Ngāti Whātua, the tribe whose land we are now gathered on. I also paid homage to the pioneers of the Māori screen industry, and I gave you a little bit of background about my tribal links and my familial links. And at the very top of my speech, I sung a song, and I apologize for that because I'm not a great singer, and it's a song that's very near and dear to my heart. It actually was the opening theme for the first Māori television program on TV in New Zealand. And that was a show called Koha. And that show was presented by my mother, Merata Mita. I want to talk a little bit more about Koha. But before I do that, there's something that I just really need to get off of my chest. Whenever I'm asked to speak at an event like this, particularly one as prestigious as this, I get a sense of a bit of a identity crisis. Imposter syndrome, I think, is the right term. And I ask myself, what gives me the right to talk about diversity and inclusion? And it's a question that I've had to ask myself quite a few times in life. And I think if there's one thing that I am an authority on, and one thing that even if the rest of this speech is all lies, that I can say with full confidence, that is, diversity and inclusion has the power to bring life into this world. In the, in the mid-80s, there was a film called Utu, and my mother was the casting director and Māori advisor on that film. And on that film, she met Jeff Murphy, the director, and then they had me. <laughs> now, the word Utu in Māori, in that context, meant revenge. But utu can also mean the price or the cost of something. So I'm pretty sure I am the utu for that film. <laughs> so as I said before, in the first instance, the power of inclusion has the power to bring life into this world. <laughs> Although I may joke about this, the question about representation and authenticity is something that weighs heavily to me. And I don't think I res felt that responsibility more keenly than when I was adapting my mother's life story into a documentary. It became very obvious to me when I looked at my start in this industry compared to my mother's, the contrast that existed. There I was in my late 20s, a carefree dude, being given a great opportunity, gifted to me. Whereas my mother, when she started her career, was a solo mother of five, who had to work three jobs to take care of her kids, and at every step of her career, she faced prejudice, she faced sexism, she faced racism. So how could I, in context of my appearance, of my privileged background, speak truth to her experience? And as a storyteller, the way I navigated through that particular obstacle was to look into history, look into the past, and I delved into the archives and I found the interviews of my mother speaking about her own experiences. I also interviewed my older siblings who went through all of those things alongside with her. And it's interesting, having spent so much time looking back on history, 
I think standing here today and speaking to you all is like being at a crossroads in time. The past is represented by the pioneering struggles of people like my mother. The present is represented by my journey, following in her footsteps. And the future is represented by the potential of this forum to inspire the next generation of storyteller. Now, if there's one thing that I'm very proud of as a Māori filmmaker, it's that we have a rich and strong history of representation on screen. As the Prime Minister said, the first film ever made in New Zealand, going all the way back to 1914, was an adaptation of a Māori story. In fact, the first four films ever made in New Zealand were adaptations of Māori stories. In 1972, you have the first Māori filmmaker to ever receive a director's credit, Ramai Hayward, who made the film To Love a Māori with her husband. I'm sensing a theme here. Anyway. In 1987, Barry Barclay's Ngāti becomes the first film ever to be written and directed by Māori. And in 1988, the film Modi is released, directed by my mother. And that film is the first film in cinema history to be solely directed by an indigenous woman. In the decades between then and now, if you look at the top 10 highest grossing films in New Zealand history, seven of them are either directed by Maori filmmakers or are adaptations of Maori stories. So despite being such a small minority, I'm extremely proud of what we've been able to achieve on screen. However, glory on screen, I think, can sometimes disguise some of the more disturbing facts of the politics off screen. And a fact that I can give you, oh, kia ora, <laughs> is that between 1972 and today, only three Maori women have ever directed a narrative feature. And while there are initiatives for diversity and inclusion, not all of them have avoided the pitfalls of tokenism. When my mother first began on Koha, it was an exciting time. There was a lot of optimism. Finally, Māori would get a place on screen. However, at her first day of work, the head of programming came down and told them only 2% of the content they make can be in the Māori language. Her disappointment from this is summed up in the following quote. Although we had transcended the sacred portals of television, our status was still no better than honorary whites. Fortunately today, we have institutions such as Te Mangai Paho, such as Māori television, to offer some redress for the imbalances of the past. But exclusion still manifests itself in more subtle ways. When I went to use extracts of Koha in the documentary about my mother, the initial quote that I received for the licensing fees in order to clear the rights to use those clips was far greater than what my budget could afford. As a filmmaker, this is a challenge, but as my mother's son, I was outraged. I couldn't believe I had to pay thousands of dollars for my mother's own work, for my mother's own words, for my mother's own image. This wasn't just limited to koha and television. This was across the board in all of my mum's filmography. My mum was a prolific documentarian in the 80s, and at that time, there's not too many photo albums of my family. So the various cameos of my older siblings in her films are like my photo album. And when I was using those images to illustrate their stories about growing up with our mother, I had to pay at least one other rights holders to use the images of my own family. So this is an issue that I take very personally, and, it, and it's hard for me to talk about this objectively because I still get really angry about it. But in between then, I've had a lot of time to think, and part of me, the logical part of my brain, can kind of see how the dynamics of the film industry works. But another part of me can't accept that, because if you accept that, what you're basically saying is that when we take a Maori story and we put it up on screen, it becomes a commodity. 
It turns into a product, and any ties to family, any ties to tradition, any ties to culture are therefore severed. And in the worst case scenarios, future generations have to buy those stories back. So, because of this experience, this personal experience of mine, I get very concerned when I hear about big budget production companies coming in and adapting traditional Māori stories or stories about Māori families. Now, thankfully, we live in a time where there are policies of inclusion, and these require at least a Māori advisor uh, as part of the crew, or in or some cases, a Māori key creative. But as my mum's experience on koha illustrates, although intentions may be good and advice may be given, advice doesn't necessarily need to be received. And at the end of the day, it is those who hold the purse strings that have the final authority. And it is exceedingly rare that those people are Māori. And what's even more sad is that even when they are Māori, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're above exploiting one another. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying this to discourage people from collaborating with Māori filmmakers. Some of my mum's best work was done in collaboration with Pākehā filmmakers, including people like the legendary editor Annie Collins, including people like my own dad. In fact, I am the product of a collaboration between a Māori and a Pākehā filmmakers. But what I am saying is when it comes to intellectual property ownership, there is a real issue in this industry. Now, all of my examples thus far have been from the past. However, you just need to look at this year. There was a funding initiative announced to fund television content for production, Maori stories. Not a single dollar from that initiative went into the bank accounts of a Maori production company. So despite our great success, why is it that these things still continue? Now that's a very tricky question, and I don't have all the answers, but I do have some insight. And that is the fact that I think Māori in this industry can't afford to be activists. We're contractors, the majority of us are contractors in an industry where we can't gain legal status as full-time employees. So we have to go from job to job in order to get by. And in a land of high housing prices, in a land of a high cost of living, it's very difficult to build a production company that not only upholds Māori values, but can pull a big budget production over the line. So. The struggle in terms of inclusion today and the difference between my mother's time and now is that although exclusion doesn't occur necessarily on the basis of identity, it is now part of an economic cycle that keeps Māori and other minorities subservient. And there are few individuals who have inspirationally broken that mold. And there are bastions such as this forum that fight and stand for inclusion. However, on the cold face of it, when you look at the industry more widespread, it is rare that those resources and those initiatives reach the ones who need it the most. And you need look no further than this very forum as evidence of that, as I know there are many Māori in this industry who can't afford to be here today. <laughs> now let's look at the other end of the spectrum, and I'm going to use myself as an example. I was the beneficiary of all the positive inclusionary efforts of the New Zealand Film Commission, of New Zealand On Air. I could go to Te Māngai Paho, I could go to Māori Television, I received support from Ngā Aho Whakari. I had the privilege of working with Cliff Curtis, who uh, across his long and successful career of an actor, has built his own production company based upon Māori values. And I was able to ensure that any royalties my film receives, if we do receive any, the majority of them will go towards my mother's estate. This is my ideal future, not just for my film, but I want this to be a viable pathway for all Māori storytellers. Perhaps then, if these levels of potential are more widespread, we will have more parity between those telling Māori stories and those with the resources who are able to pull them over the line. Because as the founder of Array, Ava DuVernay said, we don't want to be knocking on closed doors, we want to be building our own doors. And the great thing about this forum is that Array is here today. 
not only is Array here today, but many, many like them who have built their own systems of success, transcending oppressive economic cycles with tried and true measures. And I hope from them that we can gain inspiration and continue to build our own doors towards empowering minority voices because we've already seen the incredible success that we've had despite exclusionary practice. Now just imagine what is possible if we embrace the true power of inclusion. Perhaps then we may be able to sing our mother's songs freely. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa.